So let's get to our first keynote address, please. Welcome back to those of you who are taking a break. I'm very, very, very happy to introduce Rebecca Nugent, who will be our first keynote speaker of this conference. Rebecca, as you can see from her title slide, is the Stephen E. and Joyce Feinberg Professor of Statistics and Data Science at Carnegie Mellon University. She is also fairly new to the role of department head for the Department of Statistics and Data Science at CMU. Rebecca has won several awards for teaching statistics, including the ASA's Waller Award for Excellence in Innovation and in Teaching Introductory Statistics. Rebecca has also been part of the National Academies group that has been discussing and issuing position papers about data science education. And rather than read all of Rebecca's bio to you, I'll, I'll save her a little bit of time for her remarks, but we're delighted that she'll give the, the kickoff keynote address for this conference. So thanks for being here, Rebecca. We look forward to what you have to say. All right, I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Alan. So just to kind of kick things off, let me just start by just saying to all of you, just unreal gratitude, admiration, and respect to everybody. You are all amazing, for real. I, like, I don't know about any of the rest of you, but the past 15 months for me has just been like, utterly exhausting and like you feel like you're reinventing things all the time and you're just so stressed and it just never stops and I've had so many conversations with students and faculty and teachers and educators of all kinds that just you know this has really been beyond taxing but you know you're still here you're you're pushing forward statistics and data science education if you're in your pajamas good for you if you're drinking adult beverage at 9 a.m. on the West Coast, no judging, you're here. It's fantastic. Um, I do want to say, uh, this, this is kind of one of the things, my one of my high horses I get on, but everyone is under-resourced and underpaid right now. Let's all recover and then let's tackle that as a group. One of the common things I talk about is investing in people. Let's invest in people first over investing in kind of a lot of this technology promote people, people, their careers and their lives. But I want to start by saying, I just have the utmost admiration and respect for everyone who is creating all of this virtual hybrid content, um, working for to provide these quality, you know, materials and educational experiences for these hundreds of thousands of students all over the country taking our classes. And I want to say, then again, another special shout out to Kelly and Alan, and the entire cause and Escott's team for 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 you know continuing to promote our field and 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 putting on this kind of virtual conference is exhausting, and so thank you. I just just a real real round of applause. Thank you so much to Kelly and Alan and everybody for all of their hard work. I I just couldn't so grateful to be part of this community, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you guys today. So grab that adult beverage, and we've got kind of a lot of ideas maybe to talk about here. All right, so data science. I get asked a lot about data science and I, I'm really thinking about statistics and data science to kind of together. So um, if you're somebody who's like, I don't know about this data science stuff, a lot of these ideas really are thinking about statistical analysis, data analysis. But here's one particular view of data science, which is this idea of a workflow. We're solving real problems by extracting value from data. And you know, now when we think about statistics and data science, we have all of these more complicated, um, computational aspects to the problem. And this is uh, Jeanette Wing put together a piece for Harvard Data Science Review. That's where this image is from. And I'm thinking about my questions that I'm generating, and then I'm pulling together my data. I'm thinking about how to collect it and store it, process it, how do I manage it? Um, thinking about then the analysis, uh, visualizing, and, and you know, these phrases can move back and forth a little bit. I'm gonna interpret and eventually I need to adopt whatever interesting information I discover through this process. All that value that I'm extracting, what am I gonna do with it? And like, if your students are anything like my students, they all come in thinking they're gonna use statistics and data science to, they're just gonna AI, I mean, we're gonna do AI until we pass out. AI and machine learning, and we're gonna deep learn it, and we're gonna neural network, and we're gonna black box algorithm, throw a Python package on it, and we're gonna change the world. And they're often really surprised that they spend a lot of their time trying to integrate these 
you know, medium sized data sets from Excel and some old floppy disk and, you know, something that somebody wrote on a napkin and then like scanned it somewhere, you know, like real working with real data and doing real data analysis and statistics is it's a lot messier. It's, it's not as much about like, we're, we're going to apply one big algorithm and save the world. That's that's not the reality. And so it's really important for our students to get as much exposure to that as possible. And in particular, they have a really hard time sometimes thinking about, and this is in my experience, they have a really hard time thinking about how much of it is really based on human subjective decisions. And a lot of the tools that we're building, these machine learning algorithms that extract signal and structure, so much of this is still based on people. And so here's just a couple of examples to think about. Um, you're looking at just one, one dimension here, one variable. These are the velocities of 82 galaxies. And I have three different histograms and they are changing just based on the bin width that I've used. And, the, and then you have a box plot in the lower right. And so the reason that like, why, why do I wanna look at this like one dimensional histogram? Well, it turns out that in the field of astrostatistics, if you can show that there's multimodality, that indicates the presence of voids and superclusters. So it's a feature that they're using to describe the galaxies in the world or you know around us. They want to know if there are multiple bumps. And so when I'm thinking about this, well, it depended a lot on which graph I built. So if I chose the one in the upper left, I might think about that there's a mode here and maybe there's a big one in the middle and then a little small one. So maybe there's three groups, three group superclusters. If I picked the one on the upper right, I've smoothed it out a little bit. And so now I might think there's just one big uh, supercluster of galaxies. If I tightened that bin width a little bit, and uh, then I'm going to have more bumps, that histogram's gonna be bumpier. And I might think there's four or five different groups. And if I'd happen to pick a box plot, I wouldn't be able to really see this multimodality at all. And so my answer has changed depending on the subjective decision that I made about a graph. Even if I were to apply like some level set algorithm here or do something fancy to try to estimate this, at some point I still have to make decisions. Do I use the default bin width? If I'm making a density estimate, do I use a bandwidth that's default? What kind of density estimate do I use? These are the kinds of subjective decisions that can change our results. Kind of a fun one that's interesting to show your classes where it really depends on people's choices is this great um, kind of many analysts one data set example that came out in about 2018. And there, there are a couple of versions out there, but, but I'm, I'm just giving you one of the references. In this case, it was thinking about the science of data science. So how do, thinking about crowdsourcing, how do people analyze data? And they gave 29 teams of analysts the same data set with the same question. I said, okay, and, th and this is their language, their, their terminology, et cetera. Are soccer referees more likely to give red cards to players with dark skin than to players with light skin? So this is a question about discrimination. It's, it's trying, to, trying to figure out if we can find evidence of any, any kind of um, disparity, right, in, in what's happening with the referees. And the way it worked was the 29 teams worked independently. At some point, they did a peer review where they exchanged information and analysis. And in this way, I guess if one team had gone kind of way off the rails, other teams peer reviewed would have maybe pulled them back toward, this is a better way to think about the problem. And then they did some revisions and submitted final conclusions. So this is the graph of what those different conclusions looked like. This is um, 538.com's version of the graph. I just, I just like the way they have it set up. So I've used, this isn't the original one, this is 538's version of it. So in this case, what you see is each of these, each of these dots and boxes, th these correspond to one of the teams. And we have an equally likely bar going all the way across. And then you have um, wherever the circle is, that's like the point estimate, right? That's the point estimate of whatever the analysis, the model they chose to use each team. This is the point estimate of how likely or more likely were the referees to give red cards to dark skin players. So if the boxes are above the line, it's statistically significant or, or below the line. We just don't, we just don't have that here. Um, so the green are the significant results, the gray are not. And what you can see is we actually have quite a bit of variation in there, even though they did do a peer review stage. We have a group of teams that are getting around the same area. So if you saw this graph and I asked you, okay, well, is, was there, you know, were the referees more likely to give red cards? 
most people um, would say, yeah, you know, most of these teams found that, you know, they found significant results above equally likely so that they were more likely. But the reality is we never get a chance to see this. Th this is what's frustrating, I think, so much for, for students and for educators when, when we're trying to think about how to teach people how to think about data. It turns out different people think about data and data analysis differently. So maybe your group, you know, was one of the gray groups here. And in that case, you may not have done anything wrong. These were all trained analysts, but you happened to find results that weren't significant. Or you could have been one of these groups on the far right that found a point estimate way up toward three times as likely, but a huge kind of confidence interval, right? That was associated with it. And that's very different from what everybody else did, but like what's wrong and what's right. And I think for a lot of people, it's like, but what's right is really, is really um, frustrating for a lot of people thinking about how to learn data and data analysis. And we need to get really comfortable with the idea that there's going to be different things. This is okay. We should have differences. We should have variation across our data analyses. It's just kind of a question about what do we do about this? So, I mean, to all props to, to, Jeanette's, um, to Jeanette's diagram here, where it's kind of this very nice, roughly moving from left to right. I don't know about any about you guys, but like in my world, data analysis looks a lot like choose your own adventure books. It look, it's a little bit chaotic. And for those of you who are too young for choose your own adventure books, although I presume they will re-release them someday. Um, choose your own adventure books are things like you start at the, so back in the day when you used to like hold books, you know what I mean? Like actually physically held them. Um, and it would say like, you've, you're on the beach, you know, lightning is coming. If you want to go into the cave, turn to page six. And if you want to go into the jungle, go to page 12. And you'd be like, all right, cool. I'm going into the cave. You go to page six, there's, there's a bear in the cave, you're dead. And you're like, ooh, that didn't work out. So you go back to the beach and now you try to like move forward and go into the jungle. And, and the reason I bring that up is so often in data science and data analysis, you're, you're kind of looping back. You're trying to think about what went wrong, what went right, what did the person before you do? Can you understand what they did? Th these are the things that make or break data analysis and data science problems, how people communicate, how they make decisions, how they work together. Um, and so that's what we're really trying to focus a lot on at uh, Carnegie Mellon and more broadly is thinking about people and data science and data um, analysis. So let's think a little bit about what that means for education. So we, of course, have a huge emphasis on, you know, having reproducible or replicable results. So if you think back to that, like, um, to the 29 teams, right, the, of the, the analysis, if you think back on that, it, you know, we could see 29 different teams and a group of them kind of replicated each other's results. And so we might feel pretty confident about that. When we think about reproducibility, I'm using the definition that we are trying to get the exact same results with the same data and the same code. And replicability, I'm using a National Academy's definition, thinking about we're getting consistent results across studies that are trying to answer the same question. And most people think we've got to we've got to document all our code, our analyses, et cetera. Well, here's what's been happening on my like education side. And, and I'm putting intro in quotes here because I certainly don't see this just at the intro level. So the students, we've heard them say things like, so reproducibility means I do the same things I did last time and I get the exact same thing. And we're like, well, depends on what those steps were, right? Like, were you drawing random samples or were you, you know, what were those steps? And sometimes we get asked, well, I did the same steps as my friend. I used the same code. We got the same thing. Did we cheat or are we reproducible? And then I've actually had somebody who did cheat, copied all of their friend's code and answers, but then claimed that they were doing reproducibility. So I thought that was actually a pretty, pretty uh, you know, creative excuse, excuse for cheating. But the other things they struggle with are thinking about replicability. So. My friends and I use different random samples of the same data set. We got slightly different but similar results. Is that okay? Um, my friends and I collected different sets in a similar way. Uh, we have same different results. How do we handle that? And one of my favorite parts of USCOT's uh, 2019 was Ron Wasserstein gave this great talk where he was talking about the use of p-values, which just stress everybody out. I think we should probably move away from them. 
but he 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 referenced that it was like swiping right on tinder and i always thought of that as it's like it's not so much a lifelong commitment but just more of like a sign of interest and we we really shouldn't be thinking of p values as the definitive answer if we gave the same data set to 15 different people we'd get 15 different answers and different p values so it's really important for the students and educators to get comfortable with that idea and like how we're going to talk about that so when we're teaching these kinds of concepts, I mean, I know we we work hard at this at Carnegie Mellon and have a lot of lessons learned and trouble with this, um, trying to teach the students to keep track of their work. Um, there's a lot of discussion and um, sort of best practices about how to write commented code. But what if you, they aren't coding? What if they're in intro classes that it's pre-coding? You know, what if they're using a software package that's not, you know, keeping track of their R code or their Python code? And how do you keep track of decisions? How do you keep track of they looked at a graph and they made a decision about it? You know, that's not a line of code. That's a decision that someone made, right? And when we think about the replicability part, this can also get tricky because these students commonly work on one piece at a time. They rarely um, think about like they don't, they see variation in simulation activities, but they don't see variation very often in real data analysis. Because it's, it's just not as common for us to have students all working individually on the same data set and then pulling that together and talking about how different those results are. So that's something we're trying to do more of. They don't, they, that we do simulations quite often by drawing random samples and showing them variation, but not variation in, in the kind of the real world data analysis. So we're, we're trying to work on that. And the issues and questions we commonly hear are things like, well, how do we know this is right? I mean, that's, you know, that's that's always a tough one to answer, right? And so like my friend's graph looks like this, like why, why, why does mine look different? And my friend's, P, it's always the friend. Do you guys notice that? Like the, it's always the friend. The friend never has a name. The friend is always this like general friend who told them what classes to take and like what to do with their life. And the p-value is different. So why, why is mine different? And how do I decide what to do? How do we teach them how to make decisions? And they're very, very stressed about whether they're doing it right. I mean, that's a really natural, common worry, right? They're, they're not, this, this isn't abnormal to hear worry about this, right? They're very stressed about whether they're, they're doing this right. And one of the things we found is that students don't have enough exposure to the entire data science or statistical analysis pipeline. It's really hard to build that into classes or degree programs. You have a whole lot of content that you need to put into your 15, you know, 12, 10, 18, however many weeks you have in a semester. And it's really hard to have them think about that entire pipeline. And they don't really get a chance to think about decision making and how variation might happen. And then when they go out into the real world, they struggle with that. They struggle with how to make decisions. So we're trying to think about what we can do about that. So before I dive into the big, huge project, I, I, the reason I want to talk about this first is I, want, I just want to make sure I mention it because I'm going to have a call out at the end. This I'm thinking about more advanced students. So this is one particular kind of project that we're trying to get students involved with the data science pipeline. And this is an experiential learning program. So many of you probably have things like capstones um, or projects that are more like synthesis to pull all of your work together. That's kind of, that's the space that we're talking about. So thinking about capstone pro, uh, programs. Since the recent job market has pulled students toward wanting all of this real world engagement, um, they need to learn to work with outside clients, et cetera. Um, we pull in real data science problems with a large set of external partners every semester. These could be for profits, non profits, um, data for good, social services, um, NGOs, startups, you name it, we, we bring it in. And um, the students actually work on open-ended problems. So this isn't like canned stuff. This is stuff that the client doesn't know what how to solve it. The students work on that as part of their coursework. And they engage with the uh, clients and the partners like every couple of weeks. They spend time with them. Um, there's an educational project agreement that manages that relationship that handles things like intellectual property, the confidentiality, non-disclosures, et cetera. And what we find that this does is that it promotes synthesis and also kind of just-in-time learning. So thinking about like 
my client uses this kind of computing infrastructure. I haven't done that before. I need to start learning how to do that. And that, that can be really valuable to have that experience during their four years to with us versus that they're waiting until they start their first job. So thinking about, I need to be picking up different skills that are comparable to mine, but I need to be able to transition platforms. I need to think about how this data is stored this way. Um, that's been very valuable for our students. But what I want to advocate for and what we've seen can work is that to start these kinds of external engagements or real world data things like the summer after their freshman year, if not their freshman year. It's, it's really common to think of a capstone as being kind of a synthesis at your senior level. That makes a lot of sense. But if you can scope them down into say, maybe it's just an EDA project, or maybe it's like a black box, they're just gonna kind of run some models and they don't maybe need the technical theory quite yet. Learning to do these kinds of engagements early and having them practice their professional development skills can be really, really valuable. So if it's possible, and I'm speaking to all any administrator who's listening or anybody who kind of can, you know, holds a budget. If you can sort of build in these early summer engagements or a sophomore research class or anything that's scoped in that way, it'll it'll pay off dividends later. So don't wait until seniors for capstones. Just do early capstones, early engagement. And the kind of projects, this just give you an idea, I'm not gonna go through a bunch of the projects um, in detail, but we, we do things that are kind of all over. Um, we do a lot of sports related things because Carnegie Mellon happens to be, um, uh, has a, had a lot of relationships with, with uh, sports. Um, we do quite a bit of kind of finance stuff. We do things with um, logistics, uh, a lot of grocery, um, marketing, kind of you name it, we're working on it. But, but the key thing that the students find is how often these problems rely on people and the decisions that they've made. So just as a really small example, um, one of the projects that we worked on was with a global engineering procurement and construction company. So they, they do infrastructure development all over the world. They were always like colonists from Mongolia. And they do construction projects that are a few months to several years. And they have employees that include their employees, the local unions that are in whatever area they're in doing the project, and then also subcontractors, just people that they hire. They have a very strong commitment to reducing and eliminating injuries and incidents. And these injuries, I mean, we're talking like, I got a cut on my hand all the way through, like we have a toxic spill. I mean, really, really diverse stuff. And they had had this data warehouse that they were logging all of this information in and they came to us to try to help them build an interface that they could better understand the data. And one of the things there are all kinds of fun stories about this project that I'm happy to talk in the breakout session um, afterward more about. But the main the main thing that we um, the main problem here was not, there were we had technical data issues, but the main problem was actually the people because it turned out that the different groups of employees had incredibly different ways of responding to this um, request for information. So for example, if you got hurt and you were one of the company's permanent employees, you were far more likely to go report it, say what the nature of the injury was, you weren't concerned about your job, you just went ahead and reported the injury. We also had employees that had very serious things happen to them that they never reported it because they were, of course, very worried they would lose their job. So, I mean, people, you know, getting concussions and refusing to tell anyone or go to the hospital because that was their paycheck for the next six weeks. It makes complete sense. But to do the analysis, we had to take into account that people were changing the data they were reporting or their behavior depending on what kind of employee they were. Under putting that behavioral piece in there actually made the analysis much more useful for our partner because it turned out that the end results were very, very different and they had to do different targeted interventions. But it was all based on how the people interacted with the data, not the actual technical stuff. So um, I'll also reference two projects. I'm not gonna go into detail. The reason I'm referencing these two projects is that they are accepting students from all over the world really all over, I mean, they're gonna mostly do all over the country, but it's a wide call. And all of the data sets for these projects are public and you should go get them and use them in all of your classes, et cetera. So 
At Carnegie Mellon, we have two big projects going to, for COVID and epidemiological forecasting. One of them is called, as you can go to covidcast.cmu.edu and you will have more data than you even know what to do with. We are doing all kinds of things like collecting surveys from Facebook, Google, crowdsourcing things, pulling stuff from Hopkins, the CDC. This is a massive partnership and it's all being made public. Um, there's also another one called Fight COVID that is Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh that is also collecting data from all over, scraping um, information from websites at the different county levels about what kinds of pharmaceutical interventions are happening, mask rates, vaccination rates, all of these types of things. And the reason that these two, uh, I wanted to mention them is that our experience so far has been the statistical modeling is not that complicated behind the scenes here. It's, it's pretty simple statistical modeling. The hardest stuff has been working with it. This is very subjective. People self-report. People have a lot of opinions about when you're working on COVID and they tweet kind of nasty things at you. Like they have strong opinions about what you're working on. Like different states are giving you different information depending on how they feel about what you're doing. We, we can't get compliance in some areas. All of these things are based on people. And when we take that into account, we can do a better job of our analysis. It's not the technical statistical modeling. It's the incorporating that we are working with real people making decisions about their lives. That's kind of, so just again, sorry, I know I'm speaking quickly. Just again, covidcast.cmu.edu and fightcovid.org. Huge public data sets, lots of data sets, accepting um, undergrad project. You can work on the, work with all, them for all, all kinds of stuff. So just, I thought that might be a good resource to share. So when we think about this experiential learning, what we really try to push with our students is it's not about the statistical modeling. It's more about the better data, getting together that integrated data, thinking about how to clean the data, understand the data, what did people do to get the data? How did they kind of maybe bias the data? How did when they create the variables, did it bias the data? That, that's where we're focusing a lot of our attention on um, and, and with industry clients as well. The thing that I wanted to highlight before I jump into the big project, the IELTS project, is that um, we've been working on our experiential learning programs for a while. And I spent a lot of the time talking to people around the country about trying to start their own. These are really valuable programs and they are incredibly hard to build. It's expensive, there's legal complications. Um, it's, it's everybody kind of wants to work on this type of stuff, but they're under-resourced at their particular institution. And what we're interested in starting to do is build a network uh, and repositories of shared materials and projects that educational institutions can work on projects together. So, so what I want to say there is like we're working with partners to try to get projects that then can be pushed out and other institutions can use them. You know, they've been anonymized or stripped, et cetera, whatever. But we're, we're trying to build how could we launch pro real projects and capstones out to the broader community to decrease that stress of having to build those partnerships, having to work, work that legal and NDA, et cetera. We're also piloting working on projects with multiple universities working on the same project. Um, so please contact me if you're interested in, in kind of joining that effort. We'd love to make this type of experiential learning easier for anybody who wants to kind of participate, but it's gonna take a village on that one. So do please let me know if you'd like to, if you'd like to try to figure out how to do this together. All right, I'm gonna head to one of our main, our main projects here. Okay, so that was that was thinking about doing real data science with a partner. It's just kind of a short digression. We want to come back to for a second to think about we need to teach people how to do statistics and data science and think about that decision making that happens in the real world data and the real world data analysis. And you know, like 10 years ago, I don't know, oh my God, it wasn't 10 years ago. What was it? I'm trying to think about the Park City. The Park City workshop where we were putting together a data science curriculum. So if Dick DeVoe is here, he can throw the year into the into the chat for us. But um, trying to pull together statistics and data science programs, there was this explosion of them and they were all really technical. 
I think there's like 500 master's programs now that purport to be data science. I use purport there on purpose. And this is really the people science, right? Like we don't really have like 500 million people that that's way too high, I'm being dramatic. We don't really have, you know, thousands and thousands of people hopefully dissecting frogs in their backyard, but we've got people analyzing data all over the place, right? 12 year olds come to our university and tell me they have to major in statistics and machine learning. And I, I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, how do you even know what that is? The thing is, is that this human behavior, the driving force in the data analysis pipeline, that, that's really what we need to understand. We, we don't understand why people are doing the making the decisions that they're, that they're doing. So, so the project I'm gonna talk about is thinking about people in data science, but at the same time, okay, let me step, take a step back. We want to understand people and data by building tools and platforms that connect people and data. So if you have no interest in understanding people and data, which is totally fine, you still might find the platform and the tools that we're building helpful for you in connecting your students and data. So there's kind of multiple pieces here. There's, we're building educational tools and then we're kind of doing research on it. So whichever piece is of interest to you, we, we welcome having that conversation. So, so let me just give you a bit of context to say kind of what's going on over here. Um, CMU, if you're not familiar, is a private university in Pittsburgh. It's an R1 school. Um, it's about roughly 50-50 undergrad and grad, which makes like for a pretty unique environment in some ways. Um, research is pretty heavy. Like, pe like the students are really into research, even as freshmen. Um, but everybody is like obsessed with data. So uh, we have seven colleges. Um, we are in the side the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences for odd historical reasons. I'm happy to answer if you'd like. Uh, statistics and data science is in the same college with all those other uh, departments you see, economics, modern languages, history. Um, I don't have the Neuroscience Institute in there, but that's, that's um, technically in Dietrich as well. So it's a big mix. It's a big variety, big smorgasbord of people, right? There's all, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, the number below, you see the 550 is actually not updated from our last rounds. So we have about 650 of those 7,000 undergrads are majoring in statistics in some form, statistics and data science. Um, even most of our classes, even up at the senior level, like we might have a 300 person regression class and only half the class is majoring in it. So everyone is taking lots of different statistics and data science classes, even if they're not getting a degree in it. That's pretty common at our university. Even our PhD uh, courses, in statistical theory, which Lord knows why that would, you know, I, they're taking it for fun. I don't know, but it's in the hundreds as well. So every, everyone's doing it. So what we started really thinking about, and this is coming back more to the more introductory level, is um, we started doing interviews with different departments and industries about the issues they were seeing and their needs. So like when you go through a couple of statistics and data science classes, what, what are the areas that you think like people are lacking in, right? Like what, what are the skill sets they're missing? And it turned out we got a lot of heat on students don't really understand the concepts. They mostly just think about like the syntax they need. They're very, very focused on syntax. So even courses where they're doing say intro to R as part of that course, a lot of the cognitive load gets associated with learning the R syntax and not with what they're actually analyzing, like learning an ANOVA, right? Or doing something like that. So we thought that was pretty interesting. How to think about, can we teach coding and programming in a way that doesn't dominate the actual statistics content? That's something that we're thinking a lot about. And that they don't really, a lot of the people who aren't, you know, statistics and machine learning majors don't really think these classes are for them. And then they regret that down the road. So I'm sure for many people here, this is a familiar scenario. This is probably something you hear as well. Um, or if you don't, maybe you hear different things. You could put that in the chat, right, for people or in that collaborative note page that Amy sent out. So our goal was to try to modernize these courses. We're, stay, we're getting away from it just being categorical and continuous. We, they look at image data, text data, network data. This is in the intro level. Um, they do look at all different kinds of like dif different distributions. We have them tell stories with data. We have the students drive the inquiry. We think a lot about case studies and we try to build more adaptive material. 
And how we're doing that is a project called ISLE, the Integrated Statistics Learning Environment. So ISLE is used in a lot of different places now. So the statistics has really become like subject. It's used in classes that aren't statistics now. So, but for this audience, really that's, this is the genesis where it started. So ISLE is a browser-based platform. Um, you people build their entire class in it. Um, I'll show some examples in a second. They do labs, you can do labs, you can do surveys, widgets, the same types of things that you might think about doing in other types of statistical software frameworks or packages. Um, there's collaborative sketch pads and slides. The data explorers allow for students to explore, um, to do, well, explore data and aptly named, and then um, write reports and build presentations all without having to do any coding. They can peer to peer share. There's chat rooms. You can run an entire remote class. You can do, you can do videos. You, you can do it all. Um, it tracks actions. So we have data provenance and reproducibility and also helps provide feedback. So we'll do, we'll do some examples in a second, but um, so we have, uh, this is kind of a, just like a sandbox picture that we make where you can build all of these things. And it, it's all sitting in like a website. So when students log in for class or whatever, they're just going to a website. It works on your phone, it works on your iPad, it works on a computer, but it also can be downloaded. So for example, if you're in an unstable area or you're losing your internet connection or you can't afford a stable internet connection, et cetera, you could download your work. So for students who might not be in an area that's well supported um, from that infrastructure standpoint or don't have the financial resources, they could go to a library, for example, download their work, and then work, and then they could work um, on their own. Um, we're working on all the. We have all the accessibility. Uh, we meet with schools who are using this to like make sure that we're checking all the accessibility boxes. There's a lot of integrated video and audio chatting, screen readers, um, the whole shebang. So who's using it? And then we'll kind of go take a look at it. Um, it's used every year at Carnegie Mellon by hundreds of students from freshman through graduate level. Um, it's also in beta, at like lots of other, well, I wouldn't say lots, like, a, like several other universities, community colleges, liberal arts. Um, we get more every semester who are moving into this space. Um, and we have lots of different subjects that are, that are using it now because of all of the, rem the remote learning, really a lot of people grabbed onto aisle during remote learning. So you can use it as a regular class. And again, I'm going to pull up something in a second. You can do flipped classroom, remote learning. You can kind of choose your own adventure. Um, you can do things like, depending on what the answer the students typed in, they hit submit, they can see different things after that, depending on their answers, that type of choose your own adventure. We're using it quite a bit for um, retraining and upskilling for um, ex continuing education kinds of things, is executive education. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. This includes building industry dashboards and focusing on telling stories with data. The point I'd like to make there before we move into looking at aisle and thinking about like what we've learned by using it. This is a this is a hot off the presses National Academies report um, that focused on how the defense acquisition workforce. So this is a large section of the government under the DoD, how they're going to improve their outcomes using data science. But this particular, the, it focused on government, but it, it really, we did a lot of work on understanding data science industry teams and tons of interviews and testimony on kind of data science more broadly. And this, this graphic is from that report. And again, and this is hot off the press, feel free to go grab the report and take a look because it does a good job of defining the six different roles that would interact with data in that data life cycle I talked about at the beginning of the talk. And what we found throughout this study is that the stress that people feel to go be a data engineer or be a data scientist is not really what's happening in the real world. The vast majority of workers will fall into non-technical data roles, but they really need data science literacy. So the word acumen here is used in this graph as having a higher level of mastery. So just, just to clarify that definition of acumen. We should be focused, while we need all of the technical tools to help promote data science and statistics and data analysis, millions and millions of people just need to learn how to think about data, talk about data, write about data, and they're not going to code. So we, for, for whatever their jobs are, they need to be able to talk to data scientists, talk to data analysts. 
So for those of you that are focusing on the early levels of statistics and data science education, you are the soldiers on the battlefield, right? No pun intended with the, with the defense acquisition here. You, your, you are building that workforce that is so crucial to getting the data literacy out there broadly into, the, into our country and into our global workforce. The technical stuff is going well, but where we're falling short is the literacy side. This is the common thing we heard over and over again from industry people and government people. More of the, how does a marketing person talk about data with the data scientist, that kind of conversation. How do I build a data science team? How do I write about data? So, so um, anything that, if you're in that space, you, you are crucial and like keep, keep fighting the good fight there. Um, that's where I think we need to be spending more time now that we have such a collection of good technical tools that have been pushed out content and material to teach people how to code with data, we need to be swinging the other way and spending a lot of time on how to build data science teams, this type of thing. So we at Carnegie Mellon, we probably get contacted by, you know, a couple of companies every couple of weeks now at this point asking about, do we have content and material about how to think, talk and write about data? So that's where we're seeing a lot of action. And some of you may be seeing something different or something similar, but that, that's where we're seeing a lot of it. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the sharing for two seconds here. So if you go to this link, this is a website that's been built in aisle. So this is just an example of something that you can, that you can do. Um, people build their entire courses, like I said, they build their labs, they build their what have you. Um, we're we're going to do more of this in the breakout session if you'd like to come, um, come, up, come to that one afterward. If you are not coming to it, you're going to another one, totally fine. This, this exists and you're welcome to, to come back to this. You're welcome to email, you're welcome to do, et cetera. But what you'll see here is when we build these, um, these interactive sites, you can put, I have the slides here in a really kind of large form just to make it easier to see, but you don't have to do that. You can shrink the boxes. Um, you can write on these slides. We post videos here as well. The, stu the, the instructor can give the lecture using these slides, writing and doing annotations on the lecture. The instructor's annotations go to all of the students' slides. The students can annotate on their own slides. So their annotations don't go everywhere else. But it's like a fully integrated system where because they're all working on the same lesson in different roles, instructors and students, everybody can just kind of keep track of the, of the annotations and the notes there. We also have things like open-ended questions. If you have questions that you haven't put in the chat or you haven't put in the Q&A, you're also welcome to submit them here. Um, you can just type in, hey, Rebecca, can you tell me more about blank? Hit submit. It'll come to me and we'll get back to you guys as fast as we can. So please put your contact info in there. But in a lecture or a lab, students do this all the time. Instructors ask questions live in class and the students type in their answers um, either on their phone or they're doing it on their laptop or, or what have you. Um, but we also use this if students have questions. So for example, if they're uncomfortable raising their hand, asking a question in front of everybody, we have a help queue that they can just type in the answers and the instructor sees it, but nobody else does. And the instructor can start answering questions without that student having to like identify themselves. We find that to be incredibly helpful for like our shyer students, right? Who don't really want to, they don't, you know, they're just uncomfortable, right? Everyone, everyone's seen that before. We also do a lot of open-ended data analysis. So um, we allow students, so I have a data set down here for you guys, it's comic book characters. Um, there's a toolbox here that shows you all the different things that uh, you can do pretty easily in aisle. Um, when you, I, I'm opening the models tab right now to show you, this is, a, this is a variety of things you can do in aisle. This is not what it looks like at the intro level. We don't have the intro students running lasso. That's just, you know, you can turn those on and off. You can click them on and off about what you want the class to see. So, I, but I just have the example there. Um, but there is, uh, this is actually collaborative. So I, I turned, you can, you can have them be individual or you can flip on the group collaborative switch. So if anybody is, um, 
in the system with me, I'm gonna make a bar chart of the identity of these comic book characters, okay? And I'm gonna come over into the report and I'm going to drag the plot over here. And so now I see other people. So I can say, and this is all public right now, you're being recorded. So uh, we can all be in here together. So it keeps track of, if you want groups to work together, it identifies the different people. Um, they all, you can work on output and drag things together to make reports and such. And as the instructor, I'm gonna show you, I have this panel. I can see everybody's actions. So, um, and I'll stop now because I think, well, some of these are just, oh, you guys are like rabbit and cats and wombats. Okay, that's good. I didn't wanna show people's names if they were uncomfortable. Um, so you're all in there kind of anonymously. So I can, we can see what the different people are doing. I can analyze it. If I come over here in the history, I, I currently have it turned on. So you, all of your actions aren't in my history, but as the instructor, we could turn it on that all of your actions as my class go in here and I can search based on your username. And then I actually can rerun what you did. I can give feedback. I can look to see when I, instead of just looking at the final report of what someone did, I can actually rerun their entire analysis, like the steps that they did and see, oh, that's where they went awry. Do you know what I mean? Or like, that's where I can give feedback. You actually can watch their data analysis process and you can talk about it as a group to see how things worked. When I come back to the report section, um, when I float it over here, just to show you, um, that's the provenance. It's any act, anything, that, any object you create, it stores what, what was used to create it so you can recreate it later. But we also have a history button that you can watch and you can see what these different people did. So I can recreate their report. This is pretty great for when students are like, no, 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 I totally worked on that project. And the other four group members are like, no, you did not. And we're like, yeah, we can actually see who worked on the project and who didn't. But um, just something to just kind of play around with. We also have collaborative notes. Um, and so this is just another kind of sketch pad just to show you another kind of option that people use. Um, there's also a custom data explorer in here. So for, I, I showed you a data explorer of data I created. Um, you can also use this link to, uh, so I can clear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you can hit clear data if you want. You guys are welcome to go do this. Clear data, you can browse and load up your own data set if you'd like, and you choose which variables are categorical and continuous, and it will create what we were just working on together. It will create that for you. So this is trying to help people build easy to use data explorers for their own classes. Um, and then we also have some other resources down here, just like the homepage for Isle. I'll show that to you in a second. Um, there are, oh, excuse me, I'm in the wrong window here. If you go to, there's a link here, Explorer Examples, and I'll just show you this really quickly. That will take you to this page where there are lots of different explorers that we've just loaded up you're welcome to go start using them for your classes now. You're welcome to use the custom one to start building explorers for your classes. You let us know, you email us and you're, you're, you're welcome to do it, go for it. Um, and if you go to the main homepage for Isle, you will see, oh, it's loading. It's a little bit slower on Zoom, sorry. You will see lots of different examples of how you can use Isle. You could, it's used remotely, it's used in, um, you know, in, in, on, in person, hybrid, virtual. Oh, here's like, apparently I'm measuring a big fish here. So that's me and I'm talking about aisle this big. Um, but you know, there's lots of examples here that please, please feel free to, to go um, check it all out and to, uh, to, yeah, to give us feedback or let us know um, if you'd like to join the project because you're, you're welcome to join. Everybody can join. Okay. So let's go back to some slides. Let's look at a couple of examples of what we're doing and then take some questions. Okay, so, so what just kind of for those who wanna do say, what are we learning and researching? Um, we're, everything is tracked, like everything. I mean, if they type like, oh God, I hate Rebecca Nugent, she is a problem. And then they delete it. I, I technically can see that after the class is over. I mean, 
they mostly don't do that, but um, you, when the class is over, right? We, we go back and we do analysis of how, how people were learning about data, right? And we do research on it. So we do look at things about data science teams. How did the people collaborate? How can we better support them on collaborating? Um, there's a lot of research projects, not at Carnegie Mellon, other universities are using it to learn how to write with data. That's a big thing happening. Um, thinking a lot about data literacy. So I I'm showing you a couple of graphs of things I'm allowed to show. Uh, the IRB prevents me from doing other things, but just to give you some ideas, we, we describe how people write, we watch how they write over time, how that changes. Um, we look to for differences in how people answer questions. In this particular graph, I'm showing you the color, every column is a question and the color indicates the group, like the type of answer. Um, and so for example, in this second column, you can see Almost everybody's answer had like the same theme, except for a couple of people. The person in the red bar actually skipped it and like wrote that they were skipping it, which is why the algorithm pulled it out differently. We also pay a lot of attention to the sequencing. When students do data analysis, where do they go wrong? Like wh where do they go off on the path that it's hard for them to recover? So we do sequencing about like they did this graph then they did this, then they did this transformation. And we try to analyze that to see where we can improve things. We also kind of watch how they build and write their projects, how they work on their projects. And you can imagine, of course, we get our share of, you know, start the project at 2 a.m. when it's due at 9 a.m. You know, this got awful stuff. But, but we really can actually give students information about like, this was the optimal way for you to tackle this data analysis based on our research. That's really helpful for people, right? So if you use Isle or do something similar like this, you get all of these actions and information back and you can do an analysis on your class and our dashboard helps you do it to see what was the most successful way to look. What was the variation? What did the English majors do and the machine learning majors do? Turns out the English majors are fantastic at Carnegie Mellon at writing arguments with data and the machine learning majors are terrible. So we have a lot of like, we can put them in groups together and they do great, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, so here's just some more examples of watching how students are like getting to the right answer and us learning when to intervene and what kinds of interventions we can do. So we do a lot of that type of analysis. Um, and then also an aisle, um, and that's that same sandbox link I put in the chat. Um, in aisle, you can also be not just in one big group, but you can be in small lab groups. This is really great when you're remote or when you're in um, an online learning environment where your group mates might not all be in the same class as you. So like an online degree or something like that. They can chat with each other in the TA. They can view each other over video and such. And so these are just some screenshots of how we can facilitate small groups working together. Um, and letting them share their work and save it. We see that a lot is that they'll, they'll work at different times and they'll all kind of save it. So think like, like Google Docs, right? Or Google Sheets, but this is for data analysis. So, and then the instructor can like, um, the instructor can, can monitor all of this, you know, if they want. So all of the names that are, you're seeing here are either um, IELTS team members or their, you know, movie characters or whatever. So this isn't violating anything. So some of the questions that we work on are thinking about like, how can we help people switch back and forth between different data analysis contexts or tasks? How can we help students participate, right? Sometimes they feel like they're not contributing. We can identify ways they can help contribute. How do we synthesize the findings, right? How do we pull that information together? Um, as an instructor, you can search action histories to kind of see what your students are doing. You can give them feedback within the system that they can see that helps them kind of like think about like, well, why did my work go well? You can find it while they're doing the work rather than just at the end with the report. Um, and you can, you can do all kinds of studies if you'd like, if you'd like to do research studies. All right, so our big takeaway, like what we're thinking a lot about now is um, how do people analyze data? Like what, what are they doing, right? We, we, we want to build tools for them, but like we want to build tools for everybody. We're not interested in just building technical tools. We're interested in building tools that anybody and everybody can interact with data 
and that we can support them in that and we can learn from them to do our jobs better, right? That's, that's the whole goal of IELT. That, that's what we're doing. We found that people from different backgrounds are often just approaching data analysis differently, not wrong, not incorrectly, actually just different. Um, and we need to build tools, these tools and platforms. The aisle that I just showed you, for, for those who maybe saw aisle in its more infancy stage a couple of years ago, there's been a lot of uh, updates in the last couple of years that um, are supporting you can build things in aisle now that where you don't need to code or do anything you can click and do drop down menus and drag things so you can build all of this in aisle without being like a like a computer programmer right or doing anything like that we have all kinds of people working in the system um from all over so it's it should it should support whatever you'd like to do and then lastly i do want to throw a shout out to um we're doing a lot of outreach in data science. Please feel free to ask questions about that or reach out. In particular, I'd like to highlight there's a Birds of Feather session tomorrow at 1115, hosted by Michael Shuckers on one of our projects to pull people together through sports into statistics and data science education. So please uh, check that out if you'd like. And then the last thing I'll say is people are not asking us about coding. They're not asking us about programming. Everyone is asking about how to communicate, ask the right questions, work with data on teams. The big focus has all been about data literacy, not just like coding the fanciest model. The, the field is, is pushing toward how do we do this other harder stuff, right? It's very hard to do. So uh, more focus on people. And the last thing I'll say without getting on my high horse, because sometimes I do, well, not high, my like fired up horse, I'll say, um, at these talks, is um, we we have to invest in people and their careers and their lives for, for anyone here who is working on like a short-term teaching contract, like, or anyone who's an administrator here who's like, I'm sorry, let me restate. Invest in people, invest in your educators, give them long-term contracts, promote them, give them professional development time, just do it. Don't ask permission. Just give people opportunities to sit back and think, right? Like that, that's the biggest gift that we can give as kind of the field. Invest in our people. Invest in our people. Okay. And then and then I'll stop. So thank you so much, Alan. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Very, very interesting, thought-provoking, practical, everything we're aiming for. So thanks very much. We don't have much time for questions. I think in lieu of taking questions now, I'll invite you to go to Rebecca's breakout session if you'd like to ask these questions of Rebecca coming up 15 minutes from now. We are gonna keep the uh, questions that we're asked in Q&A and we'll present those to Rebecca in the breakout session and she can structure that however she'd like. But thanks again too to Rebecca. For everyone, let me point out, we've got a 12 minute break and then we have nine breakout sessions going on. Those breakout sessions are in different Zoom meetings than this one. They will be in Zoom meeting format, not Zoom webinar format. So you do need to leave this webinar and go to whichever breakout session you'd like to go to. If you haven't looked at the program recently, click where it says breakout session. You can see the list of the nine that will occur starting in 12 minutes click on the title of the one you want to attend, and then you'll see a blue rectangle. Click there where it says, click here to enter the Zoom meeting. We won't be back in webinar format as a big group again until tomorrow morning. We have a terrific panel tomorrow morning at noon Eastern, nine Pacific. That's gonna be a panel discussion about expanding horizons and fostering diversity. So please be back for that Tuesday at noon Eastern time. But please go to a breakout session next. We've got ex exhibitor technology demos after that. We've got the gather space open and the X bar open all day, but the X bar especially four to six Eastern time. So thanks again, Rebecca. Thanks everyone.